Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the University of Bradford. The University of Bradford is what we refer to now as the University of and for Bradford with global impact. And we are dedicating ourselves to make sure that we make as much impact on the social and economic recovery of our region, but more importantly, globally as well. Our researchers contribute significantly to this endeavour. And tonight we are here to celebrate Professor Julie Thornton. Uh, and Julie has been promoted some time ago now, but we haven't been able to celebrate because of COVID to Professor of Cutaneous Biology. So my name is Shirley Condon and I'm the Vice Chancellor of this wonderful university. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here and to those of you who are online. So becoming a professor is quite a momentous moment. It's the highest achievement of an academic's career and it recognises a significant level of expertise, but not just expertise, leadership, commitment and dedication to the individual's science. And Julie is one of our outstanding academics. I'm particularly pleased because Julie is a woman. It's not that I've got anything against our male academics, there's quite a few of them in the room, but we all know that women in senior positions in universities, especially professors, are underrepresented. And there's additional barriers that Julie will have had to um, overcome because she was in a minority group in terms of prog progressing through her career. And I take my cap off to her as a role model for all of our female academics and students. So thank you, Julie. So Julie is the director of the Centre for Skin Sciences. She is an expert in the largest organ of the body, the skin. And the hair follicles. And this has been the focus of her research for over 30 years. It's a long time. Isn't it 30 years to be waking up every day and dreaming about the skin and hair follicles? And it's not just because of our own skin, it's everybody else's. She wants to make an impact on the health and well-being of the population through her work. Julie was the first person to, um, in her family to go to university. And when she headed to East Anglia to study biochemistry, she probably didn't know what was lying ahead of her. But following her graduation, she certainly had no aspiration, she says, to study further. And she was offered a good job in food technology. So despite the perks, she tells me, of very cheap Arctic rolls from the factory shop, she decided it wasn't really the career for her. I must admit I'm a fan of Arctic rolls myself with a little bit of carnation cream. Um, so much to her parents' dismay, she resigned from this well-paid permanent job. And many parents would be thinking, Julie, what are you thinking of? Um, but she left this to take up a two year fixed term appointment as a research assistant in the medical school at Manchester, the University of Manchester. And that must have felt a real proud moment, Julie, I imagine, to get to get into the University of Manchester. However, Julie soon realised that to have any hope of a more permanent post, because this was a fixed term appointment, she would have to consider studying for a PhD. And again, that is a big decision to make, a big decision. So with her fixed term contract coming to an end, she applied for a job in medical research and she was particularly looking for opportunities where she could do this and study a PhD and also links to industry she was interested in. So she was interviewed here at the University of Bradford, again for a fixed term contract, but this time three years for a research assistance post, but with the opportunity to register for a PhD. You can tell by the gown she's wearing, she was successful ultimately. But Julie also interviewed for another well-paid job, um, permanent with the, uh, the Imperial Chemical Industry, which is known as ICI. And she competed against 95 individuals for this post. She was offered both of these posts on the same day. I mean, what a dilemma. 
ICI, massive industrial, you know, uh, chemical uh, in industry, and the University of Bradford. But she obviously opted to be part of the University of Bradford family, Team Bradford, and she pursued her PhD here. So she began her research in uh, skin sciences here, more specifically hair biology and endocrinology. And despite those early years, during these early years, and despite the hard work that she was doing, she had two sons and faced the balancing demands of motherhood. And I know too uh, how, how hard that is. But with growing, um, with growing cells from skin biopsies and supervising her own PhD students, and all the while also being awarded funding from external funders and continuing to publish. However, there was another much more serious challenge to overcome when Julie was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had to endure a year of arduous chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatment. I mean, it's just amazing because I was Googling some photographs of Julie just before I came in here and some were when she was first at the university and some was when she's here. And the enduring feature of these photographs is her marvellous smile. And I think she smiled and been resilient, always looked on the bright side, despite losing her own hair. And this has given Julie deep, deep empathy for those patients and people suffering from hair disorders. So more than a decade on, with such resilience and passion and tenacity, Julie's research career has gone from strength to strength, and she's seen both her sons graduate from university. And that must be really proud for you as well, Julie. Three years ago, she became the director of the Centre for Skin Sciences and the academic lead for plastic surgery in the Burns unit, which was established after the terrible football stadium fire in Bradford in 1985. And we know that the city still mourns the, uh, the injuries and the deaths that were that happened at that time. So she's forged strong industrial collaborations with the personal care and cosmetics industry as well. That's probably why she looks so beautiful. And most notably with Avida, part of the Estee Lauder company in the USA, who she's collaborated with for seven years. Julie's research also has a strong focus on wound healing, chronic wounds and pathways to reduce scarring, which we all worry about when we have surgery or injuries. Skin aging is another of her interests, and she's particularly interested in the hormonal changes that uh, impact the skin, including those related to the menopause. She can talk to me later on that one. Uh, she has recently been awarded a prestigious grant from the MRC, the BBSRC and UK Research Councils, part of a two million investment to create new knowledge and better outcomes for older people. And Julie is now leading an interdisciplinary network with four other universities in the area, area of skin mi microbiome, is that right? And how that impacts on ageing. 22 PhD students, and in 2019 was nominated by her current and former students, that's a real accolade, um, for the Times Higher uh, Education Awards, Outstanding Research Supervisor of the Year. And they wanted Julie to be recognised for the effort that she goes to to support her students. And that is a bit like the Oscars of, uh, of higher education. So Julie is also known as uh, 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 enjoyment or maybe passion for shopping or addiction, uh, to which she applies the same diligent approach as she does to skin research. I've uh, just been looking at her wonderful earrings, shoes and dress, which is looks quite exotic underneath that gown. Um, she takes everything she does seriously. Um, so on a return trip, apparently to Singapore, I don't know whether I was there, but I have seen you in Singapore. She was forced to wear multiple layers of clothing when she couldn't get all her purchases into a suitcase. So students and staff alike comment on your excellence uh, academic prowess and also your dress sense. Um, but Julie, I know that you, tonight you are very proud to have been joined on this special occasion by your family and friends. And it's amazing and wonderful to see your eldest son, Tom, here. Can't see him. There he is. Give a wave. Along with his daddy and your brother John, his wife Ruth, and your nieces Freya and Orla. I guess that you're there, yeah. And your partner John, 
who is responsible for the eclectic music selection, which we need to get on as soon as we've finished. <laughs> Apparently, you've got to listen carefully for the skin quips. Your mum is watching from the comfort of our own home, and um, your youngest son, Tom, you say if he's still, James, if he's still a work, still a work, he's in Taiwan. Well, so from Sheffield to Taiwan to Bradford, Shipley. So, Julie, um, I'm sure that everyone will join me in congratulating you for becoming a professor. Thank you for all of your contributions to the University of Bradford. You're an amazing academic. We're lucky to have you. And let's just let Julie now take the podium to present her lecture. The Secrets of Skin, What Lies Beneath. Julie. Probably one of the most obvious things um, that we that our skin um, does for us is, is a form of communication. And we can all look at people and make an instant judgment about them. Um, this might be their age. So we can see by looking at people what age they may be maybe their lifestyle. So this lady here has got very serious photo damage to her skin because uh, she's obviously a, a sun worshipper, but it can also um, indicate any um, other um, issues with our skin. So for example, here we, um, we have some um, moles that these are skin cancer. And we've all heard the phrase, oh, you don't look well. And that's basically because um, our skin will reflect um, what we've, perhaps an underlying um, issue. So, but probably the most important role of the skin is its barrier function. So the first picture shows this, um, the top of the skin. So if we look down on our skin, we need a magnifying, magnifying glass to see those little ridges and tiles. But basically that's the upper part of your skin. And some of it also, some areas also have hair follicles, so we can see the hairs coming out here. And this upper area is very important in, in producing a barrier. And if we look at it in more detail, so this um, picture is a slice through human skin, so we can cut through the tissue. This is, a, this is about five microns thick. So if you think five millimeters, it's a thousand times thinner than that. And we can use special stains to see the, the structure of it. So if we just look at this top part, this is called the epidermis, and this is what provides the barrier. And um, I'll talk about what lies beneath in the next slide, the dermis. But if we just concentrate on this one, this is this is a cartoon of it. And you can see that actually it's more complicated than it looks. It's made up of these cells at the bottom. These are rapidly dividing cells and they divide. And as they divide, they become terminally differentiated. That means they stop dividing and they fill with keratin, which is a very, very hard protein, which makes your skin uh, waterproof. And then eventually they push their way right to the top. And then this is dead. These are dead cells or dead skin, which you lose. And it takes about 28 days normally for the cells from here to move up to the top. So it's a self renewing tissue. And um, it's very, it interacts very much with the immune system. So what you also see interdispersed are some other cells in here. So you have melanocytes. Melanocytes are the cells that make the pigment for your skin. And also you have immune cells. So the immune cells act like guards patrolling to make sure nothing gets into your body. Uh, and another important function of the skin, which many people don't realize, is that the majority of your, your vitamin D is made in this upper layer of the skin, this epidermis. And uh, you can get some from your diet, but most of it is synthesized in the skin from cholesterol. And vitamin D is a very important hormone um, that impacts lots of tissues, but probably the most um, uh, one that we're most familiar with is, is the effect on the bone. And here you can see a patient with rickets. So what lies beneath? Well, actually a whole lot of exciting things. So I was just talking about the epidermis, that very top layer of the skin, which is, the, which is what we see when we look down. And this, you can see how thin it is. So it's that very thin line on the very, on the very top that is the epidermis. And it's about as thick as a sheet of paper although it can be thicker in other parts of the body, like the soles of the feet. 
This image is, uh, again, a very thin section through the scalp because the scalp has these very large hair follicles, which you can see protrude very deep into this uh, lower, lower layer. So this is a cartoon of it. So you can see some of the, some of the uh, structures more clearly. So this top bit, which is all bluey green here, is called the dermis. And the cells in here are called dermal fibroblasts and they make collagen and elastic fibers, which gives your skin its flexibility and makes it supple. And then underneath that, we have this subcutaneous layer, which is basically um, fat cells, but they're different to, this, to the fat cells that we have in our visceral fat. They're special, specialized to the skin. Within it, we also have sweat glands, and these are coiled ducts that will um, secrete mostly water, but we know it's a sweat onto the surface of the skin. And this is very important in maintaining our body temperature, regulating our body temperature because the water or the sweat on the surface of the skin will evaporate and help cool us down. It, there's also, it's also the dermis particularly is filled with blood vessels. Um, and again, these have an important role in bringing nutrients to the skin. Um, but also in helping to maintain your, regulate your body temperature. So if you're very cold, they will constrict. And, and again, people will perhaps look a little bit blue. And then if you're hot, they will dilate to uh, reduce, to help the heat escape. But one of the, but really, um, I'm all, always been. My, my PhD was on the hair follicle, so I've always had a special interest in it. And this is because it can be described as a mini organ. It has regenerative properties and it cycles. So many of the events that take place are very much as re, recapturing what happens during embryogenesis when it forms. Along with the uh, hair follicle, you have a sebaceous gland. It's always attached to it, and that secretes a lipid um, that comes out onto the hair fiber and makes your hair soft and glossy and shiny. And you can get overstimulation of these. So where we've got very small hairs on the face and they get um, they can get overstimulated, you can uh, get a lot. You can end up with acne. So there's all of this uh, below the skin. The skin's got everything, blood vessels, lymphatics, collagen fibers, elastic fibers, different types of glands, the adipose. And we're, we're very interested in the adipose because we know it also contains stem cells, as does the hair follicle. We know the hair follicle contains stem cells. So these are very important for, uh, for regeneration. And then one thing I haven't mentioned is the nerves. Um, we have different nerves in our in our skin that help us detect um, pain, help us detect heat and cold. So the skin is also a sensory organ. And just to delve a little bit more into the hair follicles. So this is um, a little biopsy from somebody's scalp and you can see how deep the follicles go. They go into this lower fatty tissue and um, Again, we can do the same principle section, very thin um, sections through, through it. And we can see all these different layers that make up the hair follicle. And um, the cells in the base, these ones here, these are the second most, fast, the second most uh, divide, fastest dividing cells in the human body after the bone marrow. So we spend a lot of energy growing hair. And um, the, the pigment you see is from the melanocytes because um, there are also melanocytes in the hair follicle that give the, give the um, fibre its pigment. But one of the, well, the area that I've always been interested in and which, where I did my PhD was on this structure called the dermal papilla at the, in the very root of the follicle. And they, these are fibroblast-like cells, but they are separated uh, during embryogenesis from the dermis and they remain separated and so they are a very specialized type of cell and they're continuous with this fibrous sheath that goes around the hole uh, outside of the follicle and it's thought that when the follicle changes size because they can because they cycle so you can get small ones and large ones and throughout life the, the, the hair follicle can change to produce a bigger a fiber and this is very much related to the size of the dermal papilla. And if we take a section, so that's a longitudinal section, and then if we do a transverse one, 
again, you can see how large the follicle is that has to support the hair. So this is the hair in the middle, the medulla, you can see the cortex and the cuticle, and then you have the follicle around it. And around that, you then have the dermis uh, or, or when it's lower down the um, fat. And we can look at this in more detail. We can stain so we can see this nice structure that the dermal pill is continuous with the sheath. And we can see these rapidly dividing cells here. And that's why people lose their hair when they have chemotherapy, because chemotherapy is designed to kill rapidly dividing cells. And because these are such rapidly dividing cells, then these are targeted um, almost immediately. So the hair is able to change because it goes through this cycle. And, and, and in doing so, it re, re, um, re, recapitulates embryogenesis. So, and the, the amount of time it send, spends in what we call the full anagen or the growing phase will depend on how long your hair grows. So on the scalp, the fo hair follicles stay in this phase for five to seven years, so you grow very long hair. But on the body, then, they, uh, then it's much shorter um, and they spend their, most of their time in this telogen phase or resting phase where the hair is still anchored into the skin but it's no longer growing. So, uh, so we see this change um, and what we see is basically a remodeling of the whole lower part of the follicle, which is something that's very unusual that happens in, a, in an adult tissue. And it's due to the interaction between the dermal papilla and the stem cells that sit in the hair follicle just near the sebaceous gland. These interact, they signal, and they start this downward growth again of the hair follicle, which then will produce a new fiber. And this is just to illustrate that it occurs in a cycle. And so this occurs throughout life. So you're continually growing uh, these hairs and different hairs. And this is an illustration of how it can change. This is an Arctic fox. So in the summer, it has this brown coat and in the winter, it has a white coat. So it's camouflaged against the snow. And the reason it can do this is because it's hair follicle cycle. And so each season, they produce different type of hair. We see this um, most in the human, most obviously in the male. So we see the transformation of the of the vellus, the small hairs in the child to these large um, beard follicles in the adult male. And again, this just illustrates that the size of the follicle and the dermal pillar is related to the size of the hair that comes out. So the beard ones are much bigger than than even the scalp. And I put this one up just to illustrate that um, I know I know it's a bird, it's a peacock, uh, but um, feathers and um, it, it's the equivalent of, of the hair follicle in the, in the bird. And this is just to illustrate the difference between, I'll take that one off for a minute, the difference between the male and the female. So the male has to invest uh, in, in producing this wonderful plumage to, um, to really um, impress the ladies. So he struts up to her and it's like, how are you doing? Uh, she doesn't look that interested, but um, in the in the bird kingdom, you see this is is quite common. Although the peacock is probably the most uh, famous one. In anim, in mammals, we see that less. We don't really see that in hamsters and rabbits. And um, but probably the most obvious one is this one, and you can clearly tell which is the female and which is the male. And um, do we have any other? Um, Examples, we have the red deer, which I did work on for a while with uh, uh, the project at London Zoo. And the red deer male also grows this mane only during the breeding season to go with the antlers. It's a seasonal breeder, so when it in the summer, it actually replaces the mane with just ordinary hair, it loses its antlers, so it looks like a female um, from the distance. And it um, and so it's almost like it goes through puberty every year because it, it has this cycle where it's at its hormones, it's, at its sex hormones, the androgens are suppressed. And the male, obviously the, um, 
the equivalent really to the mane is the beard, so the facial hair. But humans uh, have, display this really fascinating biological paradox where the same hormone that's stimulating the beard to grow can actually cause the follicles on the scalp to miniaturize. So with each cycle, they get smaller and smaller. So he's not bald, but the, the follicles are miniaturized, so they're very, very tiny. Are there any uh, examples of that in, in the rest of, uh, in other mammals? Well, not really. Although I did have a little project um, with the man-eaters of Sarvo. So these are lions, these are male lions, um, and they live uh, in a region of, of Kenya that is right on the equator, and they don't have manes, or they have very like sparse ones. Some of them have little Mohicans. So I actually went out to Kenya to try and get biopsies from these animals, um, which was quite interesting. Uh, we did look at the, they do express androgen receptors. Why they were interested is because they seem much more aggressive than other lions and they will only, they won't tolerate another male in the pride and that there, there are more females to, the ratio of uh, females to males is much higher. But um, probably one of the things that's causing this is, is what we call epigenetic changes and that's due to the environment they live in where they have, they live in a very, hot um, and it's all very thorny scrub around so that you they don't want to be getting their their manes tangled up in in those bushes so I guess that's enough about men um, then I kind of diverted my interest into women um, which are much more complicated so um, so Although androgens or male sex hormones will decrease with age, it's a very rapid uh, decrease. Whereas in women, women go through menopause. So estrogen will rise at puberty uh, and it will stay high. Uh, there will be fluctuations with pregnancy, but then it will drop off, off a cliff about the age of around the age of 50. And that's because the um, follicles in the ovary no longer produce estrogen. And so what we see are, are quite significant effects on all of the body because we know that estrogen, now we know that estrogen is not just a reproductive hormone. And the most, uh, the ones that cause a lot of concern is it, uh, the effect on bone. So because estrogen is, is good for bone, anabolic for bone, then you see bone mass, uh, loss of bone mass um, quite significantly after menopause. Oestrogen is also protective of the uh, of the blood vessels. So after menopause, women are at high risk of cardiovascular disease. And do we see an effect on the skin? Yes, we do. Um, women, and this is really on studies with women that have, are taking heart, HRT or hormone replacement therapy with those that are not. And there are significant differences in the thickness of the skin, that upper layer, in the amount of collagen produced, in the um, in the blood vessels, and also uh, we know in the in the hair follicle. So after menopause, there's a decrease in the diameter of the hairs and the growth, and a decrease in the percentage of follicles that are in that antigen, that growing phase on the scalp. So and and I think what's important to remember here is that now women are living um, until go well into their 80s. Um, so they're spending more than half their life in, an, in a state of estrogen deficiency, which impacts, uh, can impact significantly. And so although we knew that estrogen was um, important, I had these effects on, um, on the skin and the hair, people hadn't been able to show that the estrogen receptor was there. And um, so the estrogen receptor is, is something that's in the skin, in the in the cells that the estrogen has to bind to to have an effect. And um, in in 1996, uh, a second estrogen receptor, which is called estrogen receptor beta, was identified surprisingly in the male, in the testes, and the prostate. And so I actually got a grant from the British Skin Foundation, for which I'm always grateful. 
And along with Andrew Messenger, who's here from Sheffield and Tony Taylor from the University of Leicester, we looked at the expression of these different estrogen receptors in the skin. And we were the first to show that actually it's the second one, estrogen receptor beta, that's a predominant one in, in human skin and in the scalp. So after that, I became a bit of an expert on estrogens in skin and published widely um, and did a, a number of reviews. And I was particularly interested in, in aging skin. But to study particularly the hormonal effects um, of, of, uh, on, on, on human skin, we really need good human models because you know the, we can't really work on the lion and most mam the mam mammals don't have menopause. So most of my um, research has been concentrated on developing models and working with models that we can grow in the lab from human skin. So we're very lucky that we have very, very good um, contacts that we can access human skin. And working on skin is great because it's an accessible tissue. We can get it from plastic surgery or people can have elective biopsies. And so which you can't do for a lot, many of your internal organs. And so, you know, we, I mean, this is a beautiful picture. This shows the bottom of the hair follicle and you can see the capillaries, the blood vessels running down the sheath. And we can culture, we can di dissect different parts of the skin out and culture the different cells. And we can grow them in dishes either on their own or this dish shows that it's actually two dishes. You've got one inside the other so we can grow them uh, so they're in contact with one another. And one of the things that we uh, we really like working on is what we call our ex vivo models. So these are actually <coughs> lumps of uh, or pieces of skin that we've taken from people and grown in culture. So this is over six days. This is the same piece. So we made an incision in it and this is the same piece of skin six days later. I know it doesn't look, I know it's a different color. That's just the culture media, but you can see that it's, that that incision has started as closing up. And that's not just an artifact of it shrinking in culture. So again, we, we apply the same technique that we cut these very thin sections. And here you can see where we've started it. So this is the wound site. So we took a big chunk out of it. And after six days, what we see is regeneration. So that top layer, the epithelium is regenerating. It's made this what we call an epithelial tongue, but also underneath those cells have made a granular, granular tissue um, this is uh, it's like a matrix for these cells to grow across we can grow hair follicles in culture so this is the same hair follicle that's um, photographed over nine days and you can see that so this is where we cut it out that it's still continuing to produce that fiber and it stays in its anagen phase so again we know it's not an artifact what we can't do so we can look at things that stimulate hair growth or inhibit hair growth but we can't make it cycle so we're not that good yet um we can dissect all the different types of cells out so this is dissection of the hair follicle take them out like this uh, we can remove this part we can then cut this open and take the dome pillar out and grow cells so we can get very uh we can grow cells specifically from different areas of the skin now, in, to, in order for any scientific about scientific research to be valuable, it needs to be translatable. So we need to be able to translate our findings um, to uh, the benefit of people. And and my two streams are really oh sorry my two streams are really healthcare and personal care. So and the area in terms of healthcare that. Is, is really important to me is, is wound healing, uh, particularly chronic wounds. So chronic wounds are wounds that don't heal. They stay open a long time. Um, you can get leakage and odor that's, that's causing embarrassment. People will become socially isolated. Um, and it's, it's been estimated that the annual cost of managing these kind of wounds um, is more than five billion uh, to, pounds a year. And this is actually more than we spend on um, managing obesity. So it is a very serious problem. And the longer a wound stays open, the more likely it is to get infected. 
and then the more likely that is for that infection to get inside the body so then you end up with even more complications like gangrene and sepsis and of course we know that uh, sepsis um, can will kill us so it's very important to try and understand um, these wounds and how we can heal them and the other area is personal care, but again, in skin care. So keeping your skin healthy. And I, I know people are very uh, interested in anti-aging, but this is actually a good thing because as we age, our skin becomes more frail, more fragile, more prone to damage. So the healthier we can keep our skin, the better. And so a lot of the work that I've done certainly on the wound healing has been done in conjunction with the Plastic Surgery and Burns Research Unit, which was founded in 1985 after the uh, football uh, disaster, uh, the fire disaster. And um, I'm just going to highlight a few of some of the projects that we've done. So this is Susan um, Stevenson. She's now consultant at, at Newcastle, uh, at, at, the, at the infirmary in Newcastle. And she, um, we kind of did the work, some of the work that I've been doing on estrogens and applied it to wound healing. So at the same time that I was looking at the receptors for estrogen and estrogen receptor beta, a group in Manchester were looking at the effects of estrogen on wound healing. And it's been shown that estrogen is important. It will speed up the rate and quality of wound healing in both sexes. So she did a nice study and I, I Basically, this is what we call a scratch assay, and we're measuring uh, how these cells will move together. So the cells have to move. Um, this is just a, a, a cartoon to show the how the uh, how wounds occur. So you can have this wound here, so it's gone quite deep into the dermis, and for it to repair, the cells in the dermis, the fibroblasts, have to make a new scaffold. So they put new collagen down. Um, and this allows the cells on the top to restore the barrier. So that's very important. So those cells in the epidermis have to basically crawl across here and restore that barrier uh, to, stop, to stop that wound staying open. And then it will eventually uh, seal up and you have this scar tissue underneath. So what we can do in culture, we can grow the cells and we can do, mimic that by scratch, making this scratch and then we can measure the cells. So they will move and migrate towards one another. You can what you can see it with time lapse photography or you can just take photographs at, at different um, time points and then measure the distance. So you can see after 48 hours they've started to um, close that close that up. So again, she published, she found some really interesting data, which was uh, which has been published. Uh, when David Sharp retired um, as director of the unit, uh, we set up a, a research, um, a position called the David Sharp Research Fellow. And uh, this is Jing Tay, who, um, who was offered that post, and he was working uh, with me on looking at scarring. So what happens um, in the dermis is that the fibroblasts, they change to these, what we call a myofibroblast. So they become like little muscle cells. And this is very important because they contract to pull the wound together. But when, it, when they overdo it, then you can get uh, quite significant scars. So it's kind of understanding how to control this or uh, how to reduce the number of, of, of these myofibroblasts. And he did a he did a project looking at the effect of vitamin D um, on scarring. And again, was we were, he was able to show that it was important um, in reducing the the uh, differentiation of these fibroblasts into myofibroblasts. So it may have a very uh, beneficial effect um, to reduce the amount of scarring. And and sorry, and I should mention that he also won two prizes. Um, uh, and this was a really exciting one, the best paper at the European Association of Plastic Surgeons. And then Lucy, um, she's done a slightly different project. Um, she, so I said we were interested in the stem cells and they're found in the adipose or the fat tissue. Um, and this is often used to in reconstructive surgery, uh, but the problem is, and the results are very, very mixed. Um, because adipose contains lots of different types of cells. So she's been trying to isolate the stem cells 
and uh, to see uh, to look at the effect of these on, on wound healing, particularly um, in women that have had radiotherapy. So uh, following a mastectomy, then one of the um, treatments is radiotherapy, which which actually causes quite deep damage in the tissue uh, and 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 it can burn uh, the tissue as well. So um, so again, she did some amazing work and was also received a prize, the president's prize for the most outstanding contribution by a trainee uh, to the advancement of surgical science. So they're all doing uh, great work. Um, and I just want to mention this one. This is another project that we did um, on wound healing. Um, this was in conjunction with Philips. So you've all heard of Philips, they make the light bulbs and TVs and things, and they're very interested in light therapy. And we, in your eyes, you have receptors called opsins that can detect blue light and red light, and also um, these proteins called cryptochromes that regulate our, sed, uh, our, our clock, our internal clock. So we know that we go to sleep at night um, and wake in the day. And um, this project was carried out by uh, Irene here. Um, and she did, uh, again, she used this wound healing model and uh, you can see the, where we've made the wound and then it's actually regenerated and made, uh, restored that barrier. But she went a bit further and looked at some of the uh, proteins that were expressed. So this is called keratin 17 and this is only seen in regenerating tissue. So we were able to show that in this culture system, we are getting regeneration of that epithelium. And then she also showed that they also expressed these opsin receptors, the ones that we see in the eye. And we again, we were the first to uh, demonstrate this. And she also got um, a prize um, for uh, basic and translational science. And this was in, in San Diego. So, um, so I just, that's kind of most of the, the highlights of the wound healing uh, work, but um, I just want to also mention some of the work that I do with industry. And the two are really <clears throat> interlinked because if we're trying to develop um, therapies um, or smart dressings for wounds, then we do need to work with industry. But this was, um, this was a project looking at supplements that um, people may take for promoting hair growth. Uh, these are from plants and um, the, the worry or the worry for some people is that plants contain what are called phytoestrogens and it's thought that they may interfere with the effect of estrogen therapy in women taking, uh, taking trying to block their estrogens in breast cancer. But we've just uh, done a study on that and we're waiting for that to be published and shown that actually they don't interfere uh, with it. This is another project that we're doing with a company called Lab Skin. So we're working on making something called skin equivalents. So a skin, a skin equivalent is um, taking the cells and putting them together to try and make um, skin from scratch. To So we've got a, a three dimensional model and they have very successfully done this, but we're working with them to add. An, so at the moment, it's just two cell types. It's that upper epidermis and the lower cells in the dermis. But we're working with them to put this additional cell in the melanocyte that gives the it gives the pigment to the skin. And this is very important for looking at the effect, things that affect pigmentation of skin, but also for looking at uh, melanoma, because melanoma now is rising significantly in the UK and is now the fifth most common cancer um, in the UK after breast, prostate, lung and colon. Um, and we're also working, Steve's working on this project, I can see him at the back, um, along with the engineers um, to um, develop a, a smart tampon that we can put an, a, an antibacterial on so that we can treat women with um, bacterial vaginosis. But probably the one I've, I've spent the most time working on is, is Avida, which is part of the Estee Lauder company. And I must say, uh, I think when I first started, I was a bit surprised when I went into a into the Great Mall of America because they're based in Minneapolis um, and went into their shop and found out I was kind of a poster girl for them. And I was like, oh, so. Um, so what they when they came to visit Bradford, they wanted to do work on hair aging 
And really what they were asking us to do was that whole looking at the follicles, the isolated follicles. But then I, I convinced them that actually the hair follicle sits in all of the skin. So, you know, it's in contact with the dermis, with the fat and and, and the epidermis and all of this. Uh, and we know these this changes with age. And so how does this impact on the hair follicle? So we kind of really looking at the hair follicle environment and uh, these images we Again, we looked at young and aged scalps. I think this one was 21 and this one was 81. And you can just see by looking at them, there's a dramatic difference. And these, we starred on the front cover of Experimental Dermatology, which is one of the top dermatology journals. And, and Rachel, again, is sitting at the back, is, uh, was responsible for these beautiful images. And this kind of shows the changes in, in and this is scalp skin, but we see it in all skin really um, with age. So the epidermis now becomes much thinner. And um, so our barrier is com can be compromised. We also lose what we call these reap pegs, um, uh, which then reduces the surface area of the skin. And but probably what's most striking is this change in the dermis. So here it's is organized here it's very disorganized so there's the collagen and elastic fibers that this that the cells make um are disorganized um we can look at certain things we can stain for those uh, papillary fibroblasts and we can see that with age they're lost um and again rachel did this lovely um diagram to kind of illustrate those changes that occur in in the scalp and i think what you have to think about is that dermis that that the follicle sits in, it's a bit like the soil that a tree or a plant would sit in. And the fibroblasts, these, these shown by these men here, a build a scaffold, which has to be organized. And, and with age, that becomes very disorganized. And so we may see, we see changes in the hair follicle itself. And then I just want to um, show some very recent data that we have on this. I'm not going to show it all because it's very, uh, uh, it, 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 I, I'm finding it very difficult to interpret, but we're doing, doing something called single cell RNA sequencing. So normally when you take a tissue, there's lots of different cells in there. So we can take that and we can look at the genes that they express. So we can look at young and old and we can say, oh, these genes have gone up, uh, are expressed higher in old, in old skin, or, or these are, it's, uh, are reduced in, in old skin. But that's looking at the tissue as a whole. So what this technique does is to look at individual cells. So it sequences every single cell. So we put in about 10,000 cells from each cell type. Um, so we, again, we looked at young and older. So young is under 30, older is over 50. So there's a good 20 years difference. And the cell types we looked at in the, in the skin uh, is the <coughs> fibroblasts, which in the dermis that sit around the follicle, this sheath, that supports the follicle and the dermal papilla, which we know is really the master or the, or the conductor of the orchestra because it dictates the type of hair that's produced. So we looked at all of those, and that just shows that we isolated them and, and did them all separately. And then um, this is, again, quite a complicated uh, map. It shows the um, cells, how they come into clusters. So each of those dots is a single cell. So when we look at, so the old ones are at the top, the young ones are at the bottom. So when we look at the fibroblasts, for example, the ones that's, that make up the dermis, we can see that there is a change when they, between the young and the old. So they're shown by this uh, green and red, but there is overlap. So there is a shift. So there are some cells that are changing that we find are there in the old, older skin and some that are in the younger. Skin. When we look at the dermal papilla, it's completely different. So these are completely different cells. So it means that they ret retained their identity from embryogenesis, from early embryogenesis when they were separated from the rest of the dermis. So they, they likely have a lot of stem cell potential or stem cells in, in that group. But again, what we see with age is that the, um, that there's a big shift. So the young ones here are the blue, and then you can see these two 
clusters in the old that are not there in the young. So we're seeing these new populations start to arise. And then we did the sheath, similar thing, and these kind of fall somewhere between the two. So this allows us to identify gene signature in aging cells. And why is this important? This is important because um, the underlying causes of aging are very poorly understood. Uh, we don't think cells all age the same way. And what we'd really like to find out is, do they share a core of aging genes? And this is not just applicable to the skin, but it's to all our tissues that are aging. And because cell populations are heterogeneous, so there's more than one cell type in those populations, by analysing the cells on a cell to cell basis, that allows us to understand those key changes. And um, probably what's happening, oh, sorry, the aging will influence this, the function of the skin or, or, or any other tissues by changing the percentage of those cells in each um, of the identity within the tissue. So, um, so finally, I just want to talk to you about my last project, which is skin microbiome, which is really new and exciting. So we, um, we know that, so that, again, this is looking at the top layer of the skin, the epidermis. So we know that it provides this physical barrier, chemical barrier, you've got immune cells in there too. What we now know is we've got a microbiome. So we are covered in trillions of bacteria before you all start scratching. Um, and um, there's probably about a thousand different species. And they uh, seem to provide an important function. Um, now, whether that's to keep out the bad, so we've all heard about the gut, keeping your good bacteria, your gut healthy, because you have good bacteria in your gut. Uh, it seems the same is, is true of the skin. And before you all start scratching, um, this is uh, what's called a face mite, and it was in the news probably, I think, last week or so. They live in our hair follicles, and apparently they come out at night on your face to mate. Um, so, um, but they, they, they don't, they're not like nits. They're not jumping around from one to another. They, they kind of stay with their, with their host. Um, and so we have lots of different types of bacteria that sit on the surface of the skin. So actually the skin and the microbiome is an ecosystem um, and they're beneficial to, you know, they're beneficial to each other because the things that the skin produces, like our sebum, they eat it. They, that's their dinner. Um, but we know that this changes with age. We know that our production of sebum changes with age um, and our skin changes with age. But we don't really know anything about how that impacts the microbiome and how that aligns with our, um, immune, our immune system that's also aging. So, um, so as, Sh as Shirley mentioned, uh, UKR, uh, the um, MRC and the BBSRC have invested a lot of money into um, understanding aging and to try and um, you know, provide uh, better outcomes for our aging population. And so they set up all these, they've invested two million pounds in this and set up all these um, networks. And the one that I'm leading is the Skin Microbiome in Healthy Aging or SMEHA. Um, so we're working with four of the universities on this and um, we, we're hoping to get some um, exciting collaborations set up. And again, why is this, why is this needed? Why is this network needed? Um, the skin microbiome is not the same all over our body. So in different parts of our body, we have different um, communities of bacteria. So what we call moist sites or dry sites or sebaceous sites. And understanding this is still very much in its infancy. It's a very emerging uh, important science. And so if we can optimize, optimize collaboration with others, then uh, this will enhance the impact. So it's a network really designed to bring together skin scientists, microbiologists, clinicians and industry to understand and target changes in the skin microbiome with aging and to build um, capacity for research and innovation in the UK. So we don't really understand this bi-directional talk between our skin, the host and the microbiome and the metabolite or the things that they produce. Again, we don't understand that. 
So finally, I'd just like to mention all my, and I, I, I know I haven't got pictures of you all up here, my uh, PhD students, uh, because um, you've all been absolutely amazing and a pleasure um, to teach and um, to see develop into scientists yourself. And uh, again, it was great going to the Oscars, uh, University Oscars, and that was, I had to put this one up because we all had to get new dresses. Uh, and, um, and that was an amazing night. Um, but again, it's been a wonderful career working with absolutely amazing people. And uh, I, I found this picture of the ball. Uh, this was before I think we have some past students here. This was way before your time. This was 2003. So it's like nearly 20 years ago. And we can see some people that are still here today. Um, and uh, and also to point out that Sue is still in the big chair. Sure. <laughs> it's a private joke between them. <laughs> and then finally, um, Obviously, there's people that wish were here today. Um, my, my dad, my mum is actually watching from home in the comfort of a, of a hopefully she got the iPad working. Um, and uh, my, but my brother is here today, so I think you can all spot him. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and my granddad, oh, my grandparents, particularly my granddad, he was such um, a champion for me to go to university. He was a, such a, he was probably my biggest, uh, supporter but it hasn't been easy because I have I did have two children and I had them really before my career was established and so Tom is here again I don't think he's holding a gold clock but he's um and James is in Taiwan so he's hopefully watching but I suspect he looks like this by now because they are seven or eight hours ahead and he does have COVID um so and this uh, this was the summer before I actually got a permanent post because I was doing postdocs, doing contracts. I did some part time teaching, and then I finally and then I got um, a position as a lecturer at the university. So that was so again I had to juggle these children, and I also commuted from Manchester. So I did like a bit of a challenge, um, but I needed support, and that was very important particularly when they, they were young, because um, as an academic and a researcher, you're expected to go to conferences and present data. I, I, obviously, I went to Singapore, but I also went to other far flung places like Japan and Australia and Kenya looking for lions. And so really the two people that have supported me with the children most throughout that is my mum, shown here with Tom at his graduation. And yes, she is that small. And um, she, I think she always had a case, even though she didn't live nearby, I think she always had a little case packed and she'd hop on a train and, and come and, and get us out of, uh, help us out. And then of course, uh, their dad, Ian, pictured here with, with James, at his graduation, uh, and again, often left literally holding the baby. So I'm very, very proud to have accomplished um, getting to be a professor at the University of Bradford. So I'm very proud of that. Um, but probably what I'm most proud of is these two because they've grown into absolutely amazing young men. OK, thank you very much.